Hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started with the panel. So welcome to the California Law Review's 2020 Symposium, Democracy Reform for the 21st Century. This panel is called The Call to Civil Duty. My name is Bella Quello, and I'm a 2L at Berkeley Law. My pronouns are she, her. Before I turn things over to our moderator and our panelists, I'd like you all to know that we will be having a QA and a um, with about 20 minutes left where you'll be able to submit questions anonymously or you can ask them yourself. And that also this panel is being recorded and we will share the recording on our website. So yeah, thank you all for joining us. And now I'll turn it over to our facilitator, Professor Ross. Professor Virtual Ross is, Chancellor's, is a Chancellor's Professor of Law at Berkeley Law, where he teaches legislation, elect election law, and constitutional law. His research interests are driven by a normative concern about democratic responsiveness and a methodological approach that integrates political theory and empirical social science into discussions of legal doctrine, the institutional role of courts, and democratic design. In the area of legislation, his current research seeks to address how courts should reconcile legislative supremacy with the vexing problem of interpreting statutes in contexts not foreseen by the enacting legislature. And in election law, he is an examin he's examining the constitutional dimensions and the structural sources of the marginalization of the poor in the American political process. So now over to you, Professor Ross, uh, to introduce our panelists and start the discussion. Thank you so much, Bella, and um, welcome to all of you out there um, to connecting virtually. I hope that you enjoy um, this presentation and are excited as I am about the um, presentation that's about to happen. I just want to um, offer a, a brief introduction to all the panelists and then give them the time to take over the show. So let me start with um, Caroline Fredrickson, who is a professor at um, Georgetown Law School. And she's also a senior fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice. Um, uh, the Brennan Center is a nonpartisan law and policy organization that works to reform, revitalize, and when necessary, defend our country's system of democracy and justice. Uh, Professor Fredrickson was also the former president of the American Constitutional Society, mm -hmm. where I had the chance to meet her and engage in um, the mm -hmm. work of the organization during her tenure. Caroline, Professor Fredrickson will be presenting on comparative democratic decline and the warning signs in the U.S. and abroad. Um, Jacqueline de Leon will be speaking after Professor Fredrickson. Um, she's a staff attorney at the Native American Rights Fund, which provides legal assistance to legal Indian tribes, organizations, and individuals nationwide who might otherwise have gone without adequate representation. Jacqueline will be providing a brief overview of the main challenges facing Native American voters and discuss why civic duty might not be enough to motivate them to the ballot box. Um, Manu Peel, Meal, excuse me, um, is the CEO of Bridges USA, which is a national organization working to engage, educate, and inspire the next generation of civic leaders. The organization's goal, uh, goal is to create a national student movement to strengthen our democracy. Manu's presentation will focus on how to engage young people in politics and how we can promote civic discourse at a grassroots level. And finally, Jonathan Meta Stein um, is the executive director of California Common Cause, an organization dedicated to building a democracy that includes everyone. That does that uh, uh, <laughs> includes everyone. Um, the organization does work on voting rights, redistricting reform, government transparency, and money in politics to end structural inequities in our state and local democracies. Jonathan's presentation will focus on. Um, uh, it's going to talk about voting as one piece of a larger political voice. So uh, let me start. Let me start by turning it over to Professor Fredrickson. Great. Well, thank you, Professor Ross, um, and uh, thanks to all of you and to the Law Review for holding us uh, for hosting us. I um, I am very sad that um, not to be there in person. Um, I know I was so looking forward to the original symposium um, with the opportunity to interact with everybody and. Um, and such a great program and so many great speakers. I feel really honored to be um, to have been invited and to be part of it. So thank you all so much. This is such an important conversation. Um, what I thought I would do uh, was to sort of provide a little bit of a context for um, for what's happening in the United States um, uh, with respect to what else is, is happening in the world and um, and to think about it in a kind of a more analytical um, frame. Um, you know, it does seem like the world is blowing up right now. The United States is blowing up. California is burning. 
Um, and um, we're in the middle of a pandemic and the election is so fraught um, and so frightening. Um, and the sad thing is, is that, um, you know, we're not alone <laughs> in that regard. And that, um, and that much of what's happening in the United States is really has strong parallels um, around the world. Um, and, you know, from, from similar and, and varied causes. And I think it's just, you know, I'm a deep believer in, um, in thinking about um, uh, as much as our Supreme Court, at least some of the justices like to resist this, I think we can actually learn from other countries and, and, and understand in some ways how they have been more successful or less successful at resisting the waves of anti-democratic um, uh, uh, efforts. Um, what, what makes that happen um, and what can we learn? Um, and, you know, in, in, in thinking through this, um, I mean, I'm not going to say anything that's terribly um, uh, a unique here. Um, I don't think there's a whole lot of debate really about what is um, foundational for a real democracy. Um, and that is you have to have elections, you have to have speech and association rights, and you have to have rule of law. Um, and rule of law is, um, you know, is not meant to um, <laughs> refer to um, uh, policing. I mean, what we're talking about here is stability and predictability and the integrity of law and legal institutions. And in that regard, you know, especially with my background at, at the American Constitution Society um, and other work I've done, the role of the courts is so fundamental. Um, so essentially what we need are free and fair elections in which the losing side actually gives up power. Um, so there has to be a genuine possibility of change. Um, uh, must have those what are called liberal rights of speech and association that are so absolutely fundamental to democracy and practice. And they include free speech, assembly, and association. Um, and then, as I said, the rule of law issues. Um, they're all three very important, um, particularly in the American context. Um, and they work as in a kind of an equilibrium. The electoral democracy is intertwined with our Bill of Rights, our liberal uh, rights, that is speech and association facilitate political competition, um, which is, as I said, you know, one side has to give up power, you have to have real competition. Um, we've clearly never had that as a, as a true, um, uh, the ideal we, we live up, we try and live up to, but we've never um, achieved that in practice. Um, and, you know, we can all point to so many different examples in US history of the uh, various ways that constitutional rights have been suppressed or never accorded to start with and then won and then, and then suppressed and then disenfranchisement. Um, you can have, as we know, certain situations where you have a democracy or so-called democracy, which um, is, when you think of it as purely just the role of the majority in, in electing uh, uh, leaders, where those basic rights, the liberal rights of free speech and association um, uh, are um, suppressed, as well as, you know, the, the violation of racial, religious, um, sexual orientation, autonomy, um, uh, great economic inequality. Um, so there is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a somewhat, um, it's layered, right, or thick, as some people call it, um, in terms of, I'm sure Professor Ross is um, deeply um, uh, in all of the theory around uh, uh, democratic participation, way more so than me, but um, that kind of understanding of the layering and the importance of those intertwined rights. Um, so we, we can point to so many countries um, in the, the world right now where there were, um, there was a lot of hope for, a, a, you know, democratic advances. And, um, you know, particularly in Eastern Europe after the end of the Soviet Union and the, the collapse of the um, Eastern Bloc, um, you know, it looked like countries like Poland and Hungary um, uh, and Russia um, might be countries that would become part of the democratic family um, and did in fact sort of take steps. Um, and, uh, you know, and so, you know, when you think about what happened and in, 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 in particularly about, um, you know, the U.S. role, um, in some ways I think people um, were um, as, as Michael, Mike Abramowitz, who's the head of Freedom House, has, has, has suggested that there was um, a certain amount of complacency. Um, as we face a democratic recession, 
um, that we tended to underestimate um, the resistance to democracy and the fact that it's not just necessarily always that attractive that um, uh, that with a lot of things that happened that are happening now, um, democracy in the face of demographic shifts, an aging kind of dominant majoritarian or no longer perhaps majoritarian population, but majoritarian in terms of power, but aging and shrinking, um, migration, um, change in cultural um, alliances, economic shocks, new technologies. Um, um, you know, some people point to the role that was played by the US going into Iraq and saying that we were going to be building democracies. And then, of course, we blew up the country and we, you know, have not been very successful at rebuilding it. Um, so, you know, it's just been a very strong kind of um, disestablishment of the idea of democracy as a powerful force for good in other parts of the world. Um, and the U.S. in particular as a kind of a, a model country which could give um, hope to others. Um, you know, coupling all of this um, right now um, with the pandemic and, and economic despair, um, democracy is really challenged. So, you know, I, I don't have to tell you how that all plays out in the United States, and I think we're going to, you know, talk quite a bit more directly about that. Um, but when you add the technology piece and the ability to kind of weaponize the um, false narratives that are happening um, uh, about, um, about migration, about uh, the changing demographics of countries, um, uh, even with the government using false narratives, using social media, um, people in power who have a huge amount of influence lying um, and stoking up um, partisanship um, um, we have a situation of great um, instability. Um, I, 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 you know, this whole kind of meta narrative um, from the powers that be in this country of uh, America first kind of um, uh, uh, narrative um, is, is a very interesting kind of um, maybe the most strongest version of this idea of, of uh, the counter narrative to the American dream, which um, and I would say, um, you know, make America great again, uh, is something that um, so contrary to, you know, historical uh, frames is about an appeal to power, as opposed to the appeal to an ideal or a civic value, um, which I think normally is what we expect from our leaders is, is not that kind of you know, we, we can just kick ass. That's what America is. It's we're better. We're, we're, we're a shining light uh, on the hill. We're an inspiration. We, we're, we're, we live up to a high set of, of, of values about um, how um, human beings should act, how countries should behave. Of course, as I said earlier, we have, we have not, we've fallen short in so many ways um, uh, in that regard. Um, so I'm going to, um, just um, it, it, the, with the fear of being just really depressing, um, which is maybe, I mean, how we all kind of feel right now. Hopefully we'll feel better soon. Um, I did just, uh, you know, wanted to um, say a couple of things before I close um, uh, in terms of, you know, what do we learn? Um, there are, um, there have not been only bad stories. Um, um, and all we have to do is read about Belarus right now. Um, and see, um, you know, I mean, I guess there could be a bad story coming um, as Lukashenko and Putin start to um, talk about um, how the Russians might come in and, and help, but there's people are so brave, so believe in their right um, uh, to have a voice. Um, and I, uh, I think, you know, I, I, I hope we don't have to um, resort to um, uh, everyone who cares about our democracy being out on the streets, but if that's what it takes, we need to be there. Um, we need to engage in that kind of, that's our civic duty. Um, it's, there's so much at stake. Um, but there have also been successful um, efforts in other countries to, with the false narratives that have been spread, particularly by foreign governments um, in their countries trying to destabilize them. You know, I, I hate to use military terms or, you know, sort of, um, uh, uh, violent police policing terms, but you know you do kind of need a SWAT team for truth 
um, that like the Finns have done to turn back um, Russian um, uh, uh, social media attacks. Um, and then, you know, assuming, hoping deeply that we don't have to go to the streets, that the elections are, are held and are actually fair, uh, uh, fair enough to give us a result that we feel um, is legitimate and that we have the possibility ref for reforms, we cannot be complacent because our system has shown all of its weaknesses um, and we need to anchor those deep rights that we believe in in democracy in a, on a, in a much um, uh, more uh, fertile ground um, and, and water them and protect them and let that grow. We need to make sure we have a right to vote that is truly protected that, you know, that we, we, we deal with gerrymandering in a, in a very um, significant way. Um, uh, the, the ability to, to um, control money and politics um, and so forth. And, you know, and, and I would be remiss if I didn't say as, and before I close, that one thing I think is so essential for people who care about democracy in the way I described it, the thick democracy that is certainly free and fair elections where parties that lose leave uh, power, um, where there is uh, a rule of law uh, and freedom of association and speech. Um, we need to care deeply about who our judges are. And um, certainly progressives have been um, very, much behind in their engagement in this area, and that cannot be allowed to um, be something that's just a second uh, that we think about after we think about everything else. So with that, I will close and just say what a pleasure again it is to be here. Um, and I hope what I'm saying is not the Cassandra warning of bad things to come, but in just a rallying cry of what we need to do and must do and can do and will do to protect our democracy for the long term. So thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Fredrickson. Let's turn it over now to Jacqueline de Leon. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's a real honor, it's an honor to be here among these uh, distinguished panelists. And, you know, I went to school in the Bay Area and so was looking forward to, to headed back, but, you know, just know that my heart is with you all uh, during this difficult time. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit alarming, um, but, uh, you know, I, I think we can pull to, through together, uh, as Professor Fredrickson was saying. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to pivot to a pretty bleak picture myself. <laughs> um, and so uh, what I think I'm going to do is first, I'm going to give an overview of the state of Native voting, kind of some, uh, outline some of the barriers that Native Americans face when headed to the ballot box. And then I'm going to talk about um, what this does to the idea of civic duty. Um, and you know Native Americans response to their civic duty and then kind of end with some things that we hopefully uh, can do to change uh, course. And so I, I think that unfortunately it's a pretty shocking picture um, of how hard it is to vote in Indian country. Um, you know I think we've see, had some rising consciousness nationally you know seeing five-hour poll lines in Georgia and that sort of thing that you know local state actors can make it very difficult for someone to vote. Uh, and that's just been the case in Indian country, where we see that polling locations are often not placed on reservation instead on the reservations. Instead, they're placed off the reservation in a nearby border town. This means that Native Americans have to travel. They need, there's no public transportation, so they have to travel in a car off the reservation 20, 40 miles to cast their vote, um, you know, sometimes longer. Usually it's going to be in November, it's going to be a dirt road, um, and there's going to be difficulty at getting there. Uh, Native Americans uh, lack our, you know, uh, incredibly high poverty rates, uh, incredibly uh, high uh, lack of transportation, and so without vehicles, uh, it's just difficult to get to the ballot box. Vote by mail is no better. Um, when it comes to reservations, I think people are surprised to hear that the homes themselves often aren't addressed and there's no residential mail delivery. That means that, um, you know, it's, it's just not easy. You can't get a ballot at your door. You can't uh, safely return that ballot, you know, in COVID times. Um, you have to instead travel again to the nearby border town uh, to access the post office. That post office is going to be open very limited hours. Um, you know, it's a rural post office, so it'll be open Tuesdays and Wednesdays from, you know, one to four. It's not going to be open, you know, from seven to nine p.m. And so it's just incredibly difficult to vote uh, by mail 
in Indian country. And that's a very broad uh, thousand level foot uh, discussion of some of the problems, right? So in, of why it's just structurally, logistically really difficult to vote. Then we have uh, some really bad state actors. Um, it's no surprise that in a border town you have uh, over racist attitudes because what we have is, you know, really these are small towns that are descendants of settlers. And there is a long-standing history of animosity between the border town and the Native American communities. So what do we see? We see Native American voters uh, polling place being assigned a chicken coop. Uh, to vote, you know, feathers on the floor, no bathroom facilities, um, you know, located miles off the reservation. We saw a, a polling place assigned uh, as the sheriff's office, which served to intimidate voters um, from going in to vote. We see uh, police officers regularly patrolling the roads between the reservation and the polling place on election day when they normally aren't there, just checking the plates of everybody that goes by, um, you know, and, you know, given poverty, the high incidences of poverty, there's a large number of people that are really reluctant uh, to interact with the police because they don't know if they have an outstanding parking ticket or if they have a warrant or those types of crimes of poverty. And so there's a real reluctance to go into the town in order to vote. Um, and so, you know, we see uh, uh, this, this real barrier, um, both structurally because it's just hard to go vote and also, you know, um, as an emotion, it's, it's difficult to go to these border towns. Uh, you know, one town is where they still, to this day, regularly block the pipes that uh, send water to uh, the reservation um, out of just animosity for the tribal communities. Um, we heard testimony from a tribal elder there that, uh, you know, that that city um, uh, is so deeply hurtful, uh, you know, he, he cried when talking about just having to interact with that town. Poll workers, uh, you know, when you walk in, they all just sort of... Uh, become quiet and watch and silent as that native uh, worker or native voter cast their ballot. So racism is alive and well in Indian country and it's alive and well with Native Americans voting experiences. What does this mean? Um, it means that Native Americans are reluctant to cast a vote or it's just, you know, even all the motivation in the world is going to be difficult to vote. All the motivation in the world doesn't pay for the tank of gas that it takes to travel 40 miles round trip to go cast your vote. It doesn't pay for the transportation uh, to go and cast your vote. So these are, you know, barriers that are that make it very difficult to go and vote in Indian country. Um, the message also that's communicated when a polling location is off the reservation is that this is not for you, right? This system is not for you. This doesn't accommodate your life. It doesn't accom It's not here uh, uh, as a natural part of your civic participation, right? It's this other system that you have to go and force your way into. There's not sort of an invitation to participate. And so it's not surprising, I think, that Native Americans have this idea that voting, uh, you know, is not necessarily for them that it may in fact be an infringement on their sovereignty um, and that there is a uh, disconnect between uh, voting and any type of change because you know say they've tried to vote in 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 the past and whether it be a republican or a democrat uh, the pervasive poverty the pervasive uh, lack of funding uh, mean that no change ever comes to the reservation and so, uh, uh, you know, in my field of work, I think that's a, a result of a lack of political power, right? Because, you know, so it's kind of the, the, the cart before the horse. Without the political power, you can't advocate for uh, the types of change um, and the type of resources that you're entitled to, um, but you're not gonna get those type of resources um, if uh, you've given up on the, the, the um, system entirely. This is also a taught behavior. Historically, states uh, tried to disenfranchise Native Americans. Native Americans didn't become citizens until 1921. Um, they uh, also, um, uh, states had provisions in their constitutions that you had to be civilized in order to vote. So Native Americans that want to go to vote had to renounce their citizenship, their tribal citizenship in order to vote and say that they were now civilized and willing to vote. And so um, this idea that participation in American democracy is antithetical to Native American sovereignty is not just a deduction, it's also a learned and taught behavior, a taught lesson um, by states aiming to suppress the political power of Native Americans.
And so, um, you know, civic duty, I think, only goes so far, uh, if, especially if it's one-sided, right? And so I guess, you know, what I kind of want to return to is that we have a responsibility in America. We have a, uh, a chance. I think, I think the idea of America, the idea of America's redemption is the idea that we can vote or that we can all participate and claim our stake in it and claim our stake in changing it. Um, and uh, as America, I think we have to reach a hand back out to Native Americans and uh, make good on the idea that as citizens, Native Americans are entitled to participate in democracy. And the way to do that is through uh, structural opportunities and uh, making it easier to vote and mandating that it be easier to vote. And also um, that, that we want Native Americans to vote, that we want Native Americans to be a part of our, uh, that our, our system. And you know, given local attitudes, I think that the most likely avenue for at least initial change um, would have to be at a, a national level. We advocate for, for example, the Native American Voting Rights Act that mandates polling places on reservations and those type of structural changes um, akin to, to uh, you know, the type of um, uh, the type of litigation that we've seen in the past to remedy um, voting discrimination. But uh, on that note, I do think <laughs> that's that's kind of where I'll end it is, is uh, the idea that we can be forward uh, looking um, and that we should include Native Americans uh, in democracy. Thank you so much, Jacqueline, for the great presentation. Um, now we'll turn it over to um, Manu Neal um, right now. Uh, thanks, Professor Ross, and, and I'm uh, grateful to, to be on this panel with all of you. Uh, I want to thank the, the organizers for adapting to COVID and figuring out that there's an alternative moment for having this symposium. I also want to thank the panelists for somehow allowing the only non-JD participant onto this panel. Uh, so I'm going to have to make up some major legitimacy ground. Um, I also uh, really do, um, you know, I, I guess I'll start with the fact that I came from India a long time ago and I try to go back every couple of years because I got this advice a long time ago about the importance of keeping perspective. And I wasn't gonna start off with this, but I, I felt like it's necessary given I think how bleak the situation seems. And I also think it's important to, to address the problems that exist. That's the only way we're gonna solve them. Uh, but I also think perspective is important. Um, these are not, these are real problems and I think they need urgent solutions. And I don't mean to uh, bring in perspective into the conversation to necessarily paper over the need and urgency to solve the problems, but rather to keep us uh, filled with hope and optimism to address them. Because I think that the moment we give into the current situation, no matter how the bleak the problems are, I think that's when the powerful forces win. And it sort of gets to both Professor Fedrickson's point and um, what you've said, Jacqueline, earlier about how political power is meant to disenfranchise people. They, people want that to happen. Um, that being said, I, I just graduated this past May from uh, Cal, and it, the, the past four years have been not only very engaging and exciting, but they started uh, in my freshman year with these massive protests by this guy named Miley Yiannopoulos, which I'm sure most of anyone that's associated with Berkeley knows about. And as a freshman, thinking about, you know, how can we create some sort of change? What, what are some things that we can do? It was, it, was a, uh, it was a moment and a gut check to see what was happening and transpiring not only in our campus, but I think what's reflective of campuses and, and problems across the country. And this is not a free speech tirade, actually. What I, what I saw was, I think, a little deeper. I think that I felt that there was a big chasm between young people on one side, which felt extreme resentment towards the political system, felt extreme the need to divest and seek radical change, and another side of young people that felt completely apathetic. I think that hopelessness and resentment, that cocktail of, of uh, character definition, I think is what is going to lead to not only uh, substantial problems in the future of democracy, but if young people and the, and the leaders of tomorrow feel that this system is not worth fighting for, I think that that's where we go really wrong. And, and one of the problems that we always run into is that it is tough to talk about the investment in the future and it's tough to talk about young people when the problem is right here. And when you know people are talking about the need for short-term action, but what I'm nervous about, and I think this gets to a lot of the problems that some of the previous panelists have discussed, is that if we lose the need for long-term thinking and preempting some of these problems that are going to recur again, and to neglect the need to instill and train and equip young people with the necessary skills to get them excited, passionate, and and be effective political actors, I think that we're shooting our democracy in the foot. Um, for me, and my this is my personal opinion, I think that the root cause of 
a lack of constructive and civic engagement amongst young people um, goes deeper again than a lot of the analysis that I've seen. I've really tried to just spend the last four years just trying to understand what does it mean to be a young person at this moment in history and also what are young people across the country thinking, whether it's on, uh, in reservations, whether it's in the Midwest, whether it's in the South, whether it's on the coast. And the one consistent through line that I've seen, at least in my personal anecdotal experience, is that young people are deeply stricken with that sense of apathy and resentment. For most young people my age, we've only grown up in America defined by four large crises, 9-11, the Great Recession, a pandemic, and these uh, massive uh, protests calling for social injustice. And if you're someone that's only had those lived experiences, you don't have a great sample size of American democracy. And, and that needs to be addressed. And I think the solution to sort of that lack of divestment, that lack of faith in our uh, democracy, I think really starts with the need to disrupt civic engagement on college campuses. I think we really need to reimagine and reinvent what it means to be a civic participant on campus and in higher education. Um, there's this famous quote that says that American education and democracy rise and fall together. And I think that's true now more than ever. I think that if we don't create the necessary spaces for young people to recognize and merit and see the ways that we can create political change in this country, I, do, I think that if we don't allow young people to see that it is okay to disagree with someone that holds different beliefs than you, I think if we don't show and instill a deep level of humility, empathy, and compassion in the leaders of tomorrow, I think that a lot of the problems we see today are going to only worsen and become more salient. I think that disrupting civic engagement has to happen on two fronts. I think first, you've got to reinvent what it means to actually engage in politics when you're just entering both high school and college. Right now, if you're a young person, you just replicate the same sort of partisan molds that are already aligned in national politics. Democrat, you're a Republican, you're already sorted. For the rest of your life, you're sorted. Everything you do is gonna happen this camp or that camp. So we're already starting off quite tribal, and so it shouldn't be a surprise that tribalism only becomes worse as people age, become, become more intelligent, and learn to only re-entrench those beliefs. And I think the second space for disruption has to happen in that second level of, of problems, which is the apathy side. I think that there's a huge brain drain from civic engagement, political participation, and nonprofit work. The smartest young people that we need running our government are not running our government and are not trying to become the next political leaders and are not trying to become the next activists. Um, they're going off to do other things because they think that there's no way for the system to reflect the desires they wanna see changed. And I think that the solution actually to this, what I think is a pretty structural problem is quite simple and it's not exciting. I think it starts with deep cultural engagement. I think it's got to be about reinventing that civic space and engagement. And that's sort of where our organization comes in. And a lot of the work that I've been doing for the past four years, and I'll continue to do in a full-time capacity, which is through Bridge USA. The goal here is to not only create these chapters and these instances and institutions for local community action and change, chapters where you can have a space for empathetic disagreement, where you can know that people that you'll know and meet there are people that probably don't think like you, but that that's perfectly normal and okay, because that gives us the skills to not only be better advocates for our own beliefs, but it allows us to go out into the world and recognize that diversity is actually our core strength. What I'm scared about is that in our fight for diversity, we're actually sacrificing diversity. I think that in our fight for better ideological diversity, I think that we're treating to echo chambers. And that sort of, uh, I think hypocritical political engagement is only gonna get worse as we continue to sort of get into our silos because we need to win the next political race. The second part of Bridge addresses that brain drain problem. And it's, it's about cre creating and establishing institutions and clear set pipelines for any young person that wants to engage in politics or wants to make a change, no matter which gender they're from, which race background they're from, which city, town they're from, every young person that feels that they wanna get engaged and want to make a social impact should have a very clear set pipeline that this is how you can achieve it. And more importantly, that there aren't resource limitations. I think that fixing that resource limitation side is a big issue and reason for why a lot of students that are of color have a hard time getting engaged because there are real fiscal trade-offs that you've got to make along with the broad hopelessness that exists in our politics. And so our organization works very strongly to figure out how we can resource, finance, and equip the next generation of leaders to get engaged in our politics so that our smartest people are not leaving, but are entering the good fight. And I think that is crucial 
So I'm just going to leave us with this, which is I think that we have to do everything we can to get the leaders of tomorrow to have a seat at the table today. I, if there's three things that I've learned from my just travels and, and, and discussions with the young people across the country, I think I've, I've seen three good facts that I think are going to leave us with some hope. I think first, most young people have immense moral ambition. Uh, the students that aren't left hopeless, and I think the students and young people that feel that the system needs to change or that they want a better politics that works for every American, they have that tremendous desire to achieve that change. Second, I've seen that most young people are in tremendously issue driven. That I think this generation is unique in that they are not as caring about what parties in power and they care more about what is actually being done to address the issues and that's evidenced by um, the movements on gun control, the movements of climate change. I think that young people are incredibly issue driven. And third is that I think a lot of young people are uniquely altruistic because they've noticed and recognized the structural instabilities like this and a lot of them have grown up in it. And we're doing a good job allowing them to get access to different institutions of power. And I think we gotta show them the light to, to get engaged. There's one last point I wanna make about how I think we can reframe young people's civic engagement and then I'll stop here, which is that I think we have to think about and treat young people not as a voting block, but as a block of lifelong civic participants. I think if you look at a demographic entirely as we gotta get their votes out, that turns civic engagement into one instance every four years. And that isn't a practice. And I think what we have to do is figure out what are the steps needed to make sure that young people actually become lifelong civic participants and not simply electoral participants. Because when we have pure electoral participation, I think that that only leads to that short-term thinking that replicates our polarization. So thank you so much, Professor Ross. I'll stop there. Thank you, Manu. It's great um, hearing about your organization and the work that it's doing. Um, let's turn finally over to um, Jonathan Meta Stein. Excuse me. Um, thanks, Professor Ross, and, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> I hope everybody's staying safe and hanging in there with the quarantine, the smoke, and everything else that's. Um, uh, that we have to deal with today in this, this sort of era of peak stress. Um, so I'm Jonathan Methestein. I'm the executive director of California Common Cause. We're an organization dedicated to build a building a democracy that includes everyone. As Professor Ross mentioned at the jump, we work on voting rights, redistricting, money in politics, and other issues to try to end structural inequities in our state and local democracies and to create governments at all levels that are responsive to and reflective of California's communities. Um, so ironically today, I wanna to talk about the limitations of voting. Um, I know this, uh, we've, there's been over the last many days, um, there's been uh, in-depth conversations about voting. And I could talk about the changes coming in California's election in November to make voting safe and accessible amid a pandemic. I could talk about the challenges that voters in California will likely face in November and what voters can do to make sure I make extra sure uh, that their votes are counted. I could talk about um, voter messaging research that explains um, how uh, we can message to voters about the changes coming for voting amid a pandemic. But today's panel is about a call to action, not legal or policy details. And so I wanna take us in a slightly different direction. Um, since graduating from Berkeley Law in 2013, I've spent seven years now working as a voting rights attorney, doing everything I possibly can to expand access to the ballot. When I was at the ACLU, when I was at Asian Law Caucus, now at Common Cause, my colleagues and I will do everything we can. We will work so, so hard to register one additional voter or to ensure one more voter can access their ballot. But in the wake of the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and with the ongoing pro protests on behalf of Black Lives, I'm hyper aware of the limitations of voting and the futility of narratives about how people should vote their anger or how they should march right to the ballot box and vote out this person or that person. Voting is critically important, but as lawyers, we too often forget the other forms of civic engagement and political voice that are just as important. So take, for example, policing reform. If you disagree with the law enforcement practices in your county, theoretically, you could vote out the sheriff or the DA. And there are amazing advocacy groups working on doing exactly that. But it's actually super hard to do without tons of money, political savvy, and a great candidate who has a different approach to criminal justice than the incumbent. So what we're saying, if we say, hey, you can vote out the sheriff or you can vote out the DA, what we're saying is if you spend years developing political expertise and connections that you likely don't have the time to build, 
And if you find a candidate who likely doesn't exist, you might have a chance at changing the way law enforcement operates in your county. And no wonder, given all of that, that in moments of pain and anguish, the promise of the democratic process of voting can feel so hollow. Right? And, and, and if I'm going to draw a finer point, some pain, some frustration, some anger, some injustice is just so heavy and so urgent, it cannot be adequately expressed or addressed every two years at a voting booth. Voting doesn't work in every moment for every person. And also, structurally, focusing on voting excludes a lot of our community members. When I was at Asian Law Caucus doing voting rights work in immigrant communities, we always knew that when we spoke about voting, we were reaching a fraction of the community. There is real leadership among people who can't vote, people who are not citizens, people who have criminal convictions that bar them from voting, people who are too young to vote. Those people and their voices matter just as much as voters. And that's why it's important, yes, with a major election coming up, we should be talking about voting, but it's just important to continue this conversation after November to talk about expanding access to democracy, not just access to the ballot, to talk about lifting up the voices of communities who are left out of all of our democratic systems, separate and apart from the vote. Democracy means all sorts of things that don't include casting a ballot, organizing in your community, organizing at your child's school, volunteering for a cause or with an organization, speaking at a public meeting, writing a letter to a decision maker, filling out your census form, working as a poll worker for the more involved among us. Protest and marching and civil disobedience, even when they get messy, are also a form of civic engagement. Sometimes they're the most important form of civic engagement. For some communities, they might feel like the only form of civic engagement. Maya Angelou, I love this quote, Maya Angelou was once asked about what Black Americans of her generation did with all the anger they felt after the killings of Martin and Malcolm and Medgar. And she said, quote, you use that anger, you write it, you paint it, you dance it, you march it, you vote it, you do everything about it, end quote. Voting is critical. This symposium is dedicated to it, but it's one piece of a larger puzzle. And this moment in America also illustrates for me our enormous disparities in political voice in America. Disparities in income, in wealth, in health outcomes, in test scores, those are easier to measure. Disparities in political voice are harder to measure. So let's, let's think about that. For some of us, for most attorneys, probably for most of the folks listening to this panel, for me, we've always been able to make our voices heard in one way or another. We found voting to be straightforward. We know how to contact our city council members. We feel comfortable interacting with government officials. We have the discretionary income to donate to candidates. We have so many forms of political voice. But for so many Americans and too, too many people of color, too many low income folks, none of that is necessarily true. For so many members of the American family, they've been denied the right to vote. They have never felt like a candidate speaks for them. They don't feel comfortable speaking to a government body. They don't have the time or the money to make their voices heard. And I think about the destruction in Baltimore after the killing of Freddie Gray, the destruction in Ferguson after the killing of Mike Brown, the, killing, the destruction in Minneapolis after the killing of George Floyd. It's too easy to think peaceful protest, good. Violence and destruction, bad. It's harder to acknowledge that for some, for some of us setting fire to a building in your own community might be the only way to feel seen, to be the, uh, the only way to feel as though your demands are being heard. And that is a product of the fact that in this country, we have this massive disparity in political voice. Too many Americans don't feel as though they have a better form of political voice. So at California Common Cause, um, we are trying to build a California democracy that includes everyone, that hears every voice, whether that means voting or some other means of democratic engagement. And you might be thinking to yourself, what's left to be done in California? You've probably seen the headlines about voter suppression in other states, and you're thinking, we don't have that here in California. And you're right. We're incredibly lucky that we don't have overt disenfranchisement and voter suppression. But that doesn't mean that we've actually built a representative, inclusive democracy, quite to the contrary, in fact. In the last 10 years, California has adopted every major policy item on the voting rights wish list. Online voter registration, automatic voter registration, same-day voter registration, vote centers, and so on. And yet, California's voter turnout rate is in the lower half of the nation. 
Turnout rates for Latinx and Asian American voters in California are substantially lower than their turnout rates nationally. And California continues to see severe voter participation disparities by race and by age that have not gotten any better over time. So let me share some data about this in the March primary of this year. Turnout for eligible Asian Americans was 22%. Turnout for eligible Latinos was 23%. And turnout for everyone else was 49.5%. That's a primary. What about a general election in which communities of color turn out at higher rates? In November 2018, among eligible Asian Americans in California, 33% voted. Among eligible Latinos, 36% voted. Among everyone else, 61% voted. And we don't have data on black Californians and their voting rates because the academics that study California's electorate use surname data and can't reliably distinguish between black and white surnames. But it's safe to say that in California, immigrant communities and voters of color are voting sometimes at half the rate of white voters or something close to it. We've built a reasonably accessible election system in California over the last decade. And I say that with real satisfaction because I took part in a lot of that work. Lots of lawyers and policy experts did a lot of great stuff. We filed important lawsuits. We passed landmark legislation in California. And yet, all of that legal work to increase access to the ballot, to use a law school term, was a necessary but not sufficient condition. There is something else, something deeper wrong with our democracy. We have a long, long road to travel in California until we build a democracy that actually includes everyone. And as we travel that road, we have to acknowledge that lawyers bring just one set of tools and voting is just one piece of the puzzle. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And thanks to all of the panelists. I just wanna start by leading off with a question that I think links all of the presentations thus far. And it's about what I, um, I guess I'll sort of describe how it links with the panelists. Uh, presentations. Um, Professor Fredrickson, you talk about the growing resistance to democracy um, in this country and worldwide, and I um, have to think that that's related to a growing apathy um, that has been discussed by many of the panelists in the sense that democracy does not work for them. Um, Jacqueline, you talk about the lack of voting um, by Native Americans in the country um, due to tangible cost barriers, but it goes beyond those tangible cost barriers, it, it seems to go to the sense that they do not have a stake in the elections um, because politicians are not attentive to their interests. Um, Manu, you talk about young people who are coming onto college campuses who you know, may not have a sense of civic engagement or how to engage civically and therefore um, feel apathy and even resentment. Um, towards the political process given all that has happened in their lifetimes with respect to the political process. And finally, Jonathan, you describe uh, uh, the sense that voting is not enough um, and the sense that, you know, to have the disparity in voices being heard, the disparity in opportunities to influence what happens in the political process um, that creates a sense that um, we are perhaps failing as a democracy. And that leads to, you know, this kind of vicious cycle of disempowerment that I've been struggling with myself in my own studies and scholarship and teaching as well. And that vicious cycle goes a bit like this. Individuals, marginalized individuals throughout our country um, do not participate in the political process, whether it be through voting or other forms of civic engagement, um, because maybe they don't have at, at the initial stage, the resources to participate. They don't come from a family of voters per se, or a family of individuals that engage civically. They don't come from a community that engages civically um, because that community has felt apathy and resentment towards the political process. And as a result, these marginalized communities do not vote. The result uh, is that politicians do not feel the need to be responsive to these marginalized communities. They don't vote. Their voices, therefore, have not been heard and will not be registered by politicians who make decisions that can influence their lives. And since politicians do not make decisions in ways that positively influence their lives, then that feeds back to that individual who says, why should I vote? Right? Because the politicians are not at all responsive to my needs. And that circle, that cycle, right, at some point, it seems needs to be broken. 
if we're going to have a democracy that is truly inclusive and effective, and if this multiracial, multi-community um, democ democratic experiment is going to work, we need to break that vicious cycle. So in this call for change, how do we do that? Manu, you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I was just unmuting my mic in the hope that others would unmute their mic. <laughs> um, I, uh, frankly, I, I don't think that, I, I've got a lot left to learn to understand uh, the exact dynamics. And I think a lot of the structural problems that uh, Jonathan pointed out are, I think, especially apparent. Um, but a lot of my work, honestly, focuses on rebuilding that cultural fabric. I think that a lot of that disempowerment, that circle of disempowerment that you talked about, um, oftentimes, I think one of the ways to get out of that and one of the places where this starts is when we start to correlate disagreement with people's intentions. And I think when we start to correlate and, and, and label different individuals as thinking one thing simply because there's a complete misalignment in perspective. I think that one of the root causes of our current structural failure is uh, one that not many people would like to talk about because it seems like a pretty simple problem, which is that we just don't know how to talk to each other. And I think that's crucial. And I know that this is a law review, so we gotta talk about real structural legislation that we can pass, but frankly, that is both the easiest problem to address, but I also think it's a, one of the hardest problems to address at the same time. If we start to recognize and understand the level of common pain that exists in different communities, the fact that if you go in the Midwest or if you go into the South or if you go on the coast, things like the opiate crisis, things like criminal justice uh, inequities, um, things like economic mobility affect everyone to a very equal degree. Um, obviously, there's disparities when it comes to when you factor in what race and backgrounds people are from, but I think there's common pains in this country. And I think it is with uh, the, the elites and the people in power to make sure that our citizenry does not see those common pains. Because I think that when you recognize the commonality and difficulty and struggle across different races and across different people, that's when you can start building coalitions that overcome, I think, the polarizing and structural tendencies that force people to sort themselves in different parties. Uh, the only thing that I would add to that is just, I think that young people right now offer a lot of hope, but I'm scared and nervous that if we forget to invest heavily in our higher education, invest heavily in the way that young people are thinking about our politics, I think that we're gonna miss the moment um, because a lot of students are making up their minds about what they think about American democracy, it's not good. So that's all I'd like to add to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy, thank you. That was a good, great uh, insight. Um, I'm also happy to pipe in, in, in a lot of ways I've got the easiest job because we're so far behind, right? And for me, uh, so much of my work is just knocking down the structural barriers that make it literally difficult to vote, right? So it's, you know, about passing national legislation to ensure that uh, voting, uh, polling booths are, are on the reservation. It's about um, making sure that, um, you know, that there's just access. And you know, obviously, my work at NARC is is largely struck centered on um, on that. But I do think that as a lesson, you know, in some ways, and also a reflection of the unique history and story of Native Americans, um, is that there has to be a discussion about what we're doing when we bring those polling places to Indian reservations. It's not a uh, oh, here you go, you know, we've been behind on this and, uh, you know, or we got forced into this. It has to be a, you know what, you are an equal and valuable part of this experiment and let me provide you the access, which is my obligation as an American, to make sure that you are as included as I am and that I've been failing that obligation and that we understand your sovereignty, which is not in conflict with participation in the American system, and rather that participation in the American system is the best way to safeguard, you know, your future political power. Um, and so having that conversation come from voices that aren't mine, right, come from positions of power uh, when they're making those changes, 
I think is just as important as the changes themselves so that there's a moment of reconciliation and a moment of uh, a, a recognition that Native Americans are Americans that uh, deserve to participate in American democracy. Um, I, I jump in here and um, I guess I'm just to build on those two comments, uh, hopefully build um, and not undermine. Um, I, I did you know, want to talk a little bit about um, you know, this, this question of inequality, which I think is so central, the, the feeling of powerlessness, the, 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 the difficulty of engagement when it seems like there's no reason. Um, you know, the flip side of that is that um, there has been a, quite an exploitation of the sort of politics of resentment um, and um, using that same powerlessness or feeling of, of uh, lack of status, loss of status, um, uh, uh, severe in, uh, uh, economic, uh, or at least severe feelings of economic dislocation um, and setbacks um, that has um, served the, the opposite purpose. So I think, um, you know, what I think both Manu and Jacqueline are talking about is building, um, you know, those kinds of commonalities and feelings of worth and values um, and reconstructing a kind of a civic culture where it's not make America great again or America first, but uh, about the kind of spirit of, of, um, of equality and liberty, um, uh, the ideals that, um, you know, are at least um, uh, inspired to by our constitution. Um, and I know um, Dean Chemerinsky um, is, I think, speaking on the next panel, um, but his book about the preamble of the Constitution, or about the Constitution, but using the preamble as an actual um, a substantive element to understand better the real commitments of our, of our Constitution is, is, I think, one of the most persuasive um, uh, uh, books that I have read in sort of recreating that feeling of commitments. Um, and giving a, a, a framework that um, kind of overcomes so many of the limitations of our constitution and certainly historically um, and revisioning it and certainly adding equality, which he advocates for as, as a key element that um, one could say that the reconstruction amendments uh, did provide but aren't often talked about um, and aren't part of the preamble. But um, I think that um, you know, is such an important part of this to, to overcome that politics of resentment um, and the deep wealth inequalities in our country and any other inequalities that have been either a, a tool of, uh, of, uh, of, rep of resentment and, and antagonism and anti-immigrant uh, and racism and, and misogynistic um, feelings or uh, cause a feeling of hopelessness, powerlessness and withdrawal from the civic uh, civic uh, engagement. And so I think that kind of trying to think through how do we invest in that um, a common understanding, a common civic culture uh, that um, has a grounding in a shared vision, um, I think is something that has to be a really important part of this to overcome some of those very difficult situations. Uh, and I'll just close by adding two very concrete things that might help break that cycle that Professor Ross mentioned, um, that cycle of disengagement. The, the first is, I think there needs to be massive investment from the philanthropic sector in community-based organizations that are working face-to-face -face with community every single day. Um, I think the, the massive investment that does occur in major legal organizations at the national level and policy organizations at the national level that work is important, it's necessary, it's essential. But what we know from California is that you can strike down all the legal barriers to voting that you want. It's not going to create an active culture of participation and it's not going to necessarily lead to a representative democracy. And so you have to be investing money in smaller on the ground organizations, often that are black led, Latinx led, POC led, working in the communities that have the hardest time stepping forward into our democracy. And the second thing I'll say is that we have to address the, the slow erosion of our media and our press in this country, particularly local press, local media, ethnic media, ethnic press, um, and, and uh, ethnic media or specialized media sources that serve communities of color. Because in the current environment, um, as, the, as digital advertising um, and social media have really hollowed out the press, 
data shows that news deserts that are left in the wake of a newspaper closure lead to more polarized voting, they lead to less voting, they lead to less informed voting. Um, and so we have to figure out a way to create a thriving media landscape despite the presence of um, a million challenges that, are, that is leading to the destruction of America's media over time. Thank you for those responses and it gave me a lot of food to think about or food for thought. Um, I, we have a, a question um, from the audience. I, I, I want to encourage those in the audience that have questions to submit them and type them into the Q&A. Um, but we have a question from um, Grace Coster, or Coster, who is going to um, come on camera. Um, Bella is going to put her on camera to ask her question. I think you're, I think you're live, Grace. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Um, I can't, oh, here it is. Oh, I can't see my beautifully written out question anymore. So I'm just gonna have to wing it. Um, this is primarily, thank you so much for being here. Um, this is primarily for Ms. DeLeon, but um, also curious to hear anyone. I, I'm wondering about, oh, bless you, Bella. Um, I'm wondering um, how concerned you are about um, local officials needing to match signatures and to match um, potentially like non-address residence location information for mail-in ballots with registration, specifically thinking about racism, but maybe also their innocuous challenges um, and barriers to people getting their votes counted. And specifically, um, is there anything that we can do to support Native and also other rural people of color getting their votes counted once they get into a ballot box? Um, so you put your finger on two things that I am actively worried about right now. So a uh, signature match is a big problem in Native American communities because Native American communities are less likely to use uh, to have a driver's license, right? There's lots of reasons that Native Americans don't have driver's licenses uh, in some places. 50 miles away to the nearest driver's license site. It's got fees associated with it. Native Americans don't need driver's licenses to live their lives. So, um, and when it's time to register, they're not gonna have that signature on file that can be accessed. And so it's either gonna be a live signature on a registration form, um, or it, you know, there's, a pop, there's just a lot more chance of a signature uh, gone awry. The second issue that you rose uh, that, that you raised about um, addressing is also still a, a huge issue in Indian country. So the NVRA requires that you be able to draw a map um, in order to indicate where you live if you don't have a post address. Um, and you know that's so you can say uh, the nearest cross street is you know, X and X or you know the Hogan on the corner is X and I live two miles northeast or something like that. So you technically can do that on a registration form. Unfortunately, we've seen that those types of addresses are rejected at really high rates um, and that uh, they're not necessarily getting registered um, when it's time to register, right? So they're, so I think really what it ends up becoming is a rejection of the registration registration and then the ballot ends up getting tossed because there's no, um, because the voter isn't registered. Um, I, we don't have great solutions uh, to that besides um, a recommendation that you become a poll, walk, poll watcher, that you um, say uh, if a voter is being turned away, you know, what we saw is a lot of time people weren't off offered an opportunity to cure. Um, and so uh, walking through and, 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 you know, in the moment, uh, trying to have the voter cure um, their defect and then, you know, ensure that they vote and their vote isn't voted provisionally, um, that instead that like the vote is actually voted. Um, and then other than that, you know, we're working on some long term fixes. Well, we're working on long term fixes. Um, with regard to the addressing, but also trying to get tribal IDs and signatures um, through MI, MOUs to be made available. Um, but those are going to be after this upcoming election. And so unfortunately, I think that that's just a, another systemic barrier um, that makes it difficult for natives to vote. Um, and then I also saw your second question, so I can answer it. You just asked about the Paiute. Um, 
And uh, I have a heartwarming and a disheartening answer at the same time. So the heartwarming story is we uh, conducted some interviews in Nevada shortly after that victory. And there was a 94 year old woman that shared uh, about her first time voting um, after uh, the, the, um, the location was able to come on, the polling site came on the res and how uh, proud she was to cast her vote. And that really, she said, it came down to nobody had ever asked her before. Uh, and so, uh, <laughs> and so it, you know, this was the first time that she voted because uh, this was the first time anybody asked her to vote. Um, the disheartening thing is, is this past year, Nevada moved to all vote by mail for the primary in the wake of COVID. Um, and so the gains that were made of, on reservation, unfortunately, were undercut. Um, and then the primary turnout was very low. Um, even though primary turnout is generally low, usually those are the already motivated low voters. Uh, and the primary turnout ended up being very low. We just on Friday intervened in Nevada. Uh, it's kind of a weird procedural posture, but basically the Republican Party challenged some emergency legislation that Nevada had passed that has some provisions that are beneficial to Native Americans, such a, um, so it's a, Nevada suspended um, their ballot collection ban, which is really important to Natives, so the ability to pick up and drop off each other's mail is really critical to Native communities, and so we intervened to try and defend uh, the Native American's right to be able to pick up and drop off ballots in the wake of this push and move to vote by mail. So we're still fighting in Nevada. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, there's uh, two steps forward and one step back. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that when you get on polling, on reservation polling places, people turn out. Thank you so much. We're limited on time, so I'm gonna do a lightning round of questions uh, and focus on Professor Fredrickson, um, um, Manu, and, and Jonathan uh, with, the, with the, these questions, uh, just to close this out. Um, so quick responses, I know they're probably not quick, quick answers, but for Professor Fredrickson, how do you overcome American exceptionalism? <laughs> that, suggests that, we have, that suggests we have nothing to learn from anyone. And then to Manu, how do you overcome habit and upbringing? and changing forms of civic engagement. It seems like the, the um, partisan nature of our politics comes from our families and our youth, and maybe even more so now in this partisan moment. And then final th finally, uh, a question for um, Jonathan, how much does competition and the lack thereof explain what we see as the paradox of California? So let's start with um, Professor Fredrickson. Um, well, you know, it's it's a challenge, obviously, because American exceptionalism um, is a deep seated. Um, but I think the fact of the matter is that the United States is really a very diverse country, uh, made up of people with a variety of different experiences. Um, who, um, when they bring that together, um, show the diversity, the richness uh, of of uh, our collective. Uh, experience and culture. Um, uh, and I think the more that, you know, as going back to the earlier conversation about civic values and, um, and recognizing the value um, of, of different communities, the native community, immigrant communities, um, racially diverse communities, religiously diverse communities, um, uh, that um, it becomes clear that that what makes us um, uh, special is really what we bring um, from all of those different sources. And so I think perhaps it's not um, abandoning American exceptionalism, but it's reframing it um, to say what makes us special is that kind of um, a, a richness of diverse experiences as opposed to one viewpoint um, that's kind of mythical that never really existed um, and uh, the most in its most extreme form is exclusionary um, negative and racist um, so I guess I would I would focus on on trying to build that civic culture um, that that refocuses um, why we value this country and why our our particular um, uh, rule of law and constitutional values are actually worth uh, celebrating. 
Um, for in regards to my question, I think uh, about building habit, uh, I actually wrote this down right after um, Jonathan's point, which he made that you have to build a cultural engagement without just, and you can't just uh, strike down reforms because if you remove the barriers and inequities, if people don't have that habit, it doesn't uh, yield as much uh, fruit when it comes to the actual impact on turnout and the data. Um, so I think it's really important. There's three things here, and I guess I can overlay quickly with my experience because when I um, uh, came to the US and, and my family never had history of voting or engagement, for me it took a big cataclysmic event that you know, directly had me in the middle of protests and violence. And I was like, wow, like someone's got to do something. Um, and that's that's that was sort of the Kickstarter for me. But I know that not everyone has the privilege, nor not everyone uh, can be uh, stricken by fate. So there, the three direct reforms that I've got is first, um, and this gets to Jacqueline's point, which is we have to actually go into these communities and show them that they're being heard. And and I want to make a case because I think all of us have made a case to go into communities and, and areas of color. But we are going to be undermining our democracy if we also don't go into poor white neighborhoods in the Midwest and the South. Um, that is a coalition of people that feels incredibly alienated. And I think that there has to be something done to that regard as well. But overall, I think that we've got to make a very concerted effort to show that people are being actually heard. You can't build a habit without their showing that there's some return on that habit. And right now the political system seems like it's totally operating at a 10,000 feet level and it only goes to people for their vote every four years. The second reform is we've got to have intense and engaged civic education. Um, starting uh, at the end of middle school, a lot of the data that we've looked at says that we've got to start at the end of middle school and go through high school and develop a pipeline to college. If we want civic participation to go more than just voting and we want this to be a lifelong activity, we've got to get young people early and we've got to start developing those habits and affect and make curriculum changes that help us inform and better understand our history so that we can strive for a better future. And finally, uh, number three, specifically for college students. Um, I don't think that a lot of college students realize the privilege that they get once they graduate. Um, that diploma is incredibly, incredibly valuable. And I think because we have such a val it was such a uh, attitude of taking for granted a secondary and college education, um, I think that a lot of people don't recognize that they have tremendous purpose and tremendous value in going to do something. And this gets to the brain drain problem, which is that there's a deep tendency to uh, move away from areas of social impact to um, other sorts of fields. And so we've got to make sure that we have the barriers and resources ready. And um, we have to strike down those barriers so that the resources are allocated for anyone that wants to go into some field that allows them to make real social change. That's, I think, how we sort of can at least get and start chipping away at the problem of a lack of habit around civic engagement. Thank you. Um, and in one minute, uh, I do think the fact that there are um, very few competitive national elections in California depresses turnout. But the fact of the matter is there are plenty of competitive local elections in California where decisions that actually impact people's lives on housing, on schools, on environmental justice, and so on, those decisions are being decided in close local races. And so if we're going to overcome the fact that California doesn't have competitive national elections, we need to do a better job of educating people about the fact that local elections have tremendous power. Thanks to all of our incredible panelists and for this um, very informative um, discussion. Um, and I would like to turn it over to um, Casey or Bella to give us guidance on where we what we do next. Hello, thank you all so much to Professor Ross and the amazing panelists. This has been an incredible conversation. Um, and thank you to the audience for being so patient and hanging out to the very end. Um, I want to encourage you all to tune in on Friday at noon uh, for our last panel in to, yeah, please come and come with thought provoking questions. This has been great. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Great to see everyone.